everyone. Thanks for joining Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and today we are here with Mike Chanel talking about Masters of the Universe Clash for Eternia board game. This is a brand new title you guys are going to be bringing to Kickstarter. So thank you, Michael, for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk with me and share some of this, the insight to this game. Lance, it's always good to speak with you. I believe it's Bloodborne was the last one we spoke about, and that was almost a year ago at this point, wasn't it? Yeah. That and that was that, I love that title. It's a it's a it's one that'll be on my uh, top ten list for this year for sure. So you knocked it out of the park with that one. So I'm really excited to to dig into this one a little bit more. Uh, before this interview, we had a chance to check that out on tabletop uh, tabletop simulator, and it looks really cool. So I'm excited to to get it into my hands later on whenever you guys are all done with production and that. It looks really cool. So congratulations again on that, and I look forward to seeing how well that campaign goes. So let's go ahead and dig into some stuff here. So first off, with things, uh, what does Masters of the Universe mean to you? Is this something that you were into as a child? Did you get into the comics? Did you watch any of the cartoons or TV shows? And what does it mean to you to, to be working on this project? So when it comes to Masters of the Universe, this was one of those IPs that as a kid, I had some of the action figures and I would occasionally see some of the episodes of the TV show, but I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't a Masters of the Universe like kid. You know, I wasn't like, you know, oh yeah, I want to be Skeletor. I want to be He-Man. Uh, during that same, same time frame, I actually fell more into like uh, G.I. Joe and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yep. Um, my first actual like major interaction with Masters of the Universe came from the 2002 remake or sorry, reboot, whatever you want to call it, yeah. a series that came on Cartoon Network just around the time that they were doing like Justice League and all that. That was the first like series that I remember getting into. Now at the time, I still knew all the master stuff, but that was my first exposure of just like seeing the world and everything. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to make one of those claims that like, you know, oh yeah, you know, I, I watched Masters Universe every like, you know, afternoon as a kid. Like it was one of those shows I was aware existed yeah. that I knew enough about like, you know, yes, this is Prince Adam and that's He-Man. This is Man at Arms and Skeletor is awesome. And I remember I had the action figures for He-Man and I think many faces okay. um, when I was younger. Like my grandmother got them for me and I just had them because I think everyone at some point had some Masters toys. Pretty much, yeah. Um, but, you know, and of course, as time has gone on, you know, it entered the zeitgeist again through the internet and different memes and different cultures and things like that. Um, until that initially culminated with a couple years back, um, us getting the, uh, one of our owners coming and going like, hey, we're, uh, we're making a Masters of the Universe game. And they wanted myself and Leo Almeida to uh, one of our other designers and developers at the time to be the primary leads on it. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of how that started there with the project. So, you know, I'm not going to make this big grandiose claim of like, you know, I'm the ultimate He-Man fan or anything, you know, like I am, I was going into the project before, you know, uh, officially being assigned to it. I was, I knew about as much as like your common person would probably a little bit more just because I do keep up with all the nerd stuff there, but I'm not going to be the type that says like, you know, oh, I knew about the crossover between, you know, DC Comics and He-Man where Orko became Dark Orko and ended up, you know, killing Superman and becoming a tyrant, tyrannical mad god. <laughs> now, uh, having said that, I also just said that following sentence, <laughs> which exactly um, ties into another point that I want to make is that like when we were first assigned to the project, uh, this is something I feel that is anytime we work on an IP. If you are not, you know, if you're a fan of the IP going into it, hey, great, you probably know a lot about it. But if you're not, your first duty and responsibility is to become an expert in that IP. So I remember it was literally Christmas Eve um, two years ago that we were told like, you know, the, about the initial start of the master's project and everything. And the very next like weeks after that was ordering the master's universe encyclopedia, going and watching the original series um, and then spending months and months researching like, why do people still care about this IP? Why is it still relevant for people? Why do people like, had 30 years like and are still following it, which uh, the single best like example that I can give is really the Toys That Made Us episode. Yeah. Um, if anyone like doesn't get He-Man or like really wants to understand why people like it, go watch that. It gives a really good indication of things like that. But um, you know, that was literally the first step of this project was um, for myself, it's the same thing of any IP. Um, you become an expert in that IP but not just a book expert. You need to understand intimately why people care about this property. Why is it a cherished childhood thing for people? 
Yeah, definitely. I, I totally agree. And it, you can see that in, in the previous projects you've worked on, that there is a true understanding, at least, of what you're trying to make and trying to get that as true to what the source material is that you've developed it for. So with that being said, with the design process, how was this one uh, different than some of the other games you've worked on? Where were some of the challenges that you faced with this particular IP and moving into this one? So Masters is a huge franchise, just in the scope of everything that um, it encompasses. Uh, something very specific about our game, and uh, this was a directive from Mattel that we had, is that the aesthetics and everything are based on the original 1983 toy line, first and foremost. Now, we can draw aspects from other areas of the IP and everything, and you'll actually, in the game, you'll see that. We've taken... Uh, some of the more serious tones from like, you know, things from the comics and the toy lines and the blurbs uh, to some of the more lighthearted stuff, like the way the internet has grasped onto, um, you know, uh, Prince Adam and his singing capabilities over the last decade or so. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, if you're a, a hardcore like He-Man fan or, you know, just a fan of the internet, I guess, you'll see little like, you know, nods and winks and things to all these things that, you know, if you're like just a casual player of the game, you'll be like, oh, that's kind of cool. But then you're going to have the ones who are like, oh, I, I get this and I remember this. And, you know, that's just kind of another layer that you can um, you can kind of find. Um, the As far as like the mechanics and everything go, like the, the things that we want to make sure we got is that first and foremost, this is a franchise that features some of those iconic characters out there. Like even if you don't know anything about He-Man, you can show someone Skeletor and they're going to like, oh, it's Skeletor from He-Man. Like Skeletor is actually bigger by himself than the entire uh, Masters Universe franchise. Yeah. But then you have other characters. Like if I showed you like Trapjaw and Merman and Tila or, you know, Orko, you might not directly know who these characters are, but you still at least know who they are. They're like, oh yeah, I, I, I recognize those guys. Or like you might know that they're from Masters Universe or He-Man. It's like, you know, it's very hard just to find someone who's like, I don't know anything about this or what that's from. Yeah. So that was the first and foremost challenge is making sure that every single character that we had was properly represented in the game. Uh, because everyone has someone's favorite, like someone, sorry, everyone is someone's favorite. Mm -hmm. One of our play testers, his favorite character is Ram Man. <laughs> and like, whose favorite character is Ram Man? <laughs> and it turns out that like, the reason for that is because when they played Masters Universe on their uh, in back in school, like on the playground, which I think is adorable, he was always forced to be Ram Man. <laughs> like, oh yeah, you know someone else called dibs on He Man and Man in Arms, but yeah, you, you can be Ram Man, you know, just you know, yes. But you know that's still someone's favorite character. I yep. like Merman just because he's really kind of derpy, and you know I just find that just adorable about him. Um, and I also like Trap Job because Trap Job is terrifying if you actually look at some of his backstories yeah. like he's played up for laughs in like the tv show and some of the some of the, some of the comics but then if you look at other comics like oh he's actually a psychopathic killer like yeah. huh that's that's you know yeah there's something for everyone you know but i think that was like the if you had to ask me the main thing was making sure that the characters are properly represented as far as like their personalities and like just what makes them cool yeah that's really neat so for for you, when when you start designing a game, what is your process in in doing that? Like, do you start with the mechanics first, and you build onto that, or what is your approach when starting a new game? It really depends if it is a new idea or a IP based idea. Because okay. you know, here at you know, Simon, we've done a lot of IP based games over the last few years, and those you have to treat differently than one that you're making just from the ground up yourself. If it's one that you're making from the ground up yourself, you got to think like, okay, do I want to start with a theme or do I want to start with mechanics? You know, what 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 is why do I want to do this project? Okay. When it comes to an IP based game, you have to become like I said before, an expert in that IP and really understand why people like this IP. What what attaches them to it and then you build your game around that like with masters we wanted to recreate that feeling of you saturday morning you're sitting there watching you know your your cartoons and you've got your he-man your skeletal action figures and you watch an episode and you get super pumped and then you take them and you just start like slamming them against each other and i say this to most every single interview but that's because it is 100 percent true like that's the feeling we want to recreate is you taking your toys and just you know 10 year old you 
recreating those battles there. And we're just giving you a, a canvas medium to be able to do those in a structured like game environment. Yeah. And, you know, for like masters, that was the feeling that we're trying to like really incorporate and really grasp. And it's different for each IP, uh, not to sidetrack it much, but like talk about Bloodborne. Bloodborne is known for its difficulty, but that's not all it's known for. Like that's the, 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 when you ask someone about like Dark Souls, Bloodborne, people will go like, oh yeah, those are those really tough video games. But the actual fans of the series know that there's way more to it than that. There's so much like deep, rich lore to it and everything. It's not just about the games are hard for the sake of being hard. It's because they're rewarding, tough, but fair experience. And if you don't know those nuances, those are the things that you have to learn about an IP when you're moving into it. Because if you don't know those things, then you run the risk of your product just coming across as just something that is not tied to the IP in any way, or that it just at worst feels like you just kind of made like a skin for something. And I, the, the stigma for this is like, like video game movies. How many video game movies have you seen? Like, this is clearly made by someone who doesn't actually understand. Oh, that sounds really snobbish. Clearly does not understand the nuances <laughs> of the source material. But, you know, it's like, you hate seeing that with any of your like yeah. favorite stuff, Absolutely. you know, and that's, that's what you want to avoid. Yeah. So with that, what kind of mechanics have you designed for this particular game? Like what are the, the main features of this game as a whole? I mean, you roll dice and you do cool stuff and you <laughs> slam against each other. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to like parade it and go like, you know, this is something like new and radical here. The thing is like, this is, a very much a, a everyone has cool powers you do cool stuff you roll dice you make these big over-the-top attacks you do these big cool special effects and everything this is your hollywood like kind of blockbuster action movie style game here you know everyone wants like a mirror trash where you know you're just having fun combat but yeah it's about having fun i'm not saying there's not strategy and tactics there absolutely is mm -hmm. and you know anyone who just thinks like yeah you just roll dice and random stuff happens okay, you're, you're describing like the most like rudimentary and basic way you possibly can. This is basically like, it's controlled chaos. Like you've got cool effects that you have and strategically using those to complete objectives and scenarios all the while feeling like a complete badass while you're doing that. That's the whole point. So, you know, like when you're playing a Skeletor, you want to feel like a maniacal genius who's like siphoning life and like throwing havoc bolts and, you know, mind controlling, you know, everyone around you and just doing you, everything you do, you should be want to follow it up with just doing the Skeletor laugh. Meanwhile, playing as He-Man, you know, you want to do heroic, cool stuff that makes it seem like you are the, the strongest man in the universe. You know, you know, you want to have those moments where you're going to pick up the enemy and just hurl them against another enemy or, you know, raise your sword. I have the power and just, you know, bring down the lightning on everyone. You know, it's those cool things you want to do. You should always feel like you're doing something like, you know, something cool, something badass, something that a 10 year old would be losing their mind about. Exactly. <laughs> Um, as far as mechanics go, like I said, it is a it is a combat heavy game, scenario based, but everything is based around like, you know, again, the combat of it. Uh, I don't want to use the term like skirmish game because that makes people think it's more like just direct head to head. This is very scenario driven where you're going to be completing different objectives. It's just that usually the answer to a lot of those is violence. Um, I know that the original like TV show and toy line don't promote violence, a lot of throwing, never a sword slash. But, you know, it's still, a, it's a conflict-based game. Let's use yeah. that word, conflict. There we go. Um, if, if you had a He-Man game that was, that you didn't have any conflict in, like forces of good and evil fighting each other, then I, I feel you've emerged into that whole thing where you missed the mark. And the conflict yeah. can be a number of ways. Yeah. In this one, it's just represented by, you know, you're using cool attacks and sword slashing guys, or, you know, uh, using, you know, uh, superpowers, you know, super cool powers to, you know, summon, you know, soldiers and things like that. So from there, leading into the next thing, so what are the different modes that this game has? I know it, the, the main feature of it is the, the one versus many where one person is going to be the controller trying to either control the good guys or bad guys against a potentially a one or a group of players. But I know that there's some other stuff that's, that are, that's in this game as well. So can you tell me a little bit about some of those different modes that are included? So essentially we have two primary uh, game modes that also three different scenario types between them. Primarily, as you said, the game is a one versus many. You have a group of players each playing a single character, and then you have one person playing the controller who is controlling a group of characters, minions, has like some special strategy cards, and doing some sneaky tricks to uh, basically make sure the players don't win, or actually let me rephrase that, make sure that they complete their objectives because 
the one impression that I don't want people to have on this is like you're taking on the role of a DM or like a dungeon master where you're not really so much trying to win. You're just trying to make sure the players have a good time. That's not your purpose in life here. You are trying to win. If you're not actively trying to win, you're going to lose. <laughs> and, you know, that's how it's going to be. Mm-hmm. So I this shouldn't be a situation where someone is going like, oh, man, I got saddled with playing the, uh, the you know, the controller here. I've got to make sure everyone else here is having fun. This should be like, hmm, yes, I get to be the controller and control my evil hordes. <laughs> Um, So that's like the primary method is the one versus many. Uh, We also have full co-op rules, though, in the game, uh, which follows an AI process where the controller is fully automated. So let's say like, you know, okay, for some reason, no one in your group wants to be the controller and doesn't want to experience the joy that I just said of being the evil mastermind or the heroic mastermind, you know, you can be King Randor, I guess, and, you know, send your brave forces out to, you know, win. Uh, But we do have full AI rules for um the controller side so if you want a full co-op experience where it's your play your you and up to three other friends up to four players playing against the ai controller you can do that as well noting that that method also supports full solo as well so if you want to just play by yourself versus the game you can do that and that's another little thing that i'm going to bring up here as well is actually player scaling because that's always a topic as well when you were playing solo you can play full solo in this game you don't have to like control multiple characters you know, it's like solo in the fact that like you're playing four players worth of characters. That's not how it is here. This is true solo. And the way that works is because the game scales based on the number of heroes, uh, sorry, player characters that are going to be uh, played by the players. Uh, if you're playing like, so someone's going to be the controller, uh, let's say you only have two friends. Okay, you're going to have two characters. They're just going to get to double up on their actions every round to do the equivalent of four because, you know, they're, that's your buddy. Now it's your buddy duo. You know, they're each pulling their own weight to play. If you're playing a single character, basically they get more actions. So essentially as the players, your action economy scales based on the number of players you have, where if you have your full gambit of four players, everyone's taking a single turn. Or if you have one character, he's basically getting the equivalent of four activations in that same round. But the game is built to scale off of that. So, you know, if you have just yourself versus another player playing one-on-one, that works. Yourself versus two players, up to, you know, four players in the opposing team. That's really um, cool. And again, all of that can be done via someone playing as the controller or via AI. So if it's just you and your friend, you want to play AI, do two players, AI versus controller, you can do that. You can play one character each for two characters. You can play two characters each, or you can play like, I'm going to play two characters. You play one character. So a total of three characters in play that scales as well. So, you know, a lot of this game, we've tried to make as much as like of a controlled sandbox system as we can to incorporate, you know, what do you, how do you want to experience Masters of the Universe and how do you want to play this game? Full co-op, full AI, one versus many. Do you want to be the heroic warriors? Do you want to be the evil warriors? You know, all of these things are open as options for you. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting as well because um, obviously in a lot of the one versus many games that I've played in the past, the one person, the, the, the controller or the GM or however you want to say it, is usually the one that's controlling the bad guys and then everybody else is always the good guys where you give the players the option with this one to be as the controller, you can be the good guys or the bad guys and vice versa for the, the other team, which is really interesting and really opens up a lot of different dynamics that I thought were really cool. So as we mentioned before, just talking about like the characters of this setting, the bad guys are just as iconic as the good guys. And frankly, I think that you'd have a 50, 50 split here as far as people picking like, okay, which one of these guys do you like, which one of these guys do you dislike? This is different than some other IPs where like the villains are very clearly villains and people love to hate them. But here the villains are just kind of enduring as well. Like, you know, it's like you look at Beast Man and it's like, oh, come on. Like, yeah, he's a vicious monster. But I mean, look, he's, look, it's Beast Man. Like, come yeah. on. So, you know, and then people go like, oh, yeah, he, man, like, he's kind of cool. He's really more of a dork than anything else. I don't ever want to be him. Like, come on. <laughs> no, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be Man in Arms, a.k.a. Dad, you yeah. know, or Tila, a.k.a. Mom. Like, they're losers. I want to be, you know, Trap Jaw. I want to be Evil Lynn, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel that if you didn't give people that that option there, then you know it would just be a missed opportunity. Mm. Yeah, totally. I, to- I it is really interesting how it's different with this one. And from that point, were there any mechanics or development things that you wanted in this game that didn't quite make it into the final version? As I know, a lot of the times in game developments, there's a, there's things that you include and try 
that don't necessarily work uh, for the over, overall flow of the game. So were, was there situations like that with this one that you really wanted to include certain mechanics or things that just didn't make it? So I think that's how it is with like most of the game design process is that when you start a project, you kind of throw everything you want in there. Like, yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's throw this in there. That'd be cool as well. And then you start the trimming process where it's like, okay, what is the core of this game? What is it all about? And then you have to start making those decisions about like, okay, well, it doesn't need this. It doesn't need this. And then you do that process for a little while. And then you start getting to the tough decisions where it's like, oh, we really want to include this, but does it really need this? And is this something that we can really like, you know, do well here? And that's when the decisions start getting tough. And that's more of a general game design philosophy because you can theoretically, if you have infinite amount of time and resources, you could make the ultimate game that is just everything. Hmm. Never seen it done, but I suppose if you had like a decade or two, you could probably do it. <laughs> um, but one element in this game that I that we did end up cutting out is originally there was going to be like a campaign system okay. for like leveling up your characters and slow progressing skills and things like that. Um, which, by the way, just to mention, the game is scenario-based and it's very single-shot scenario-based. There is no campaign system in the core game. Um, actually, people will read too much into that. There is no campaign system in the game or any of the, ex <laughs> uh, the, the expansions that may or may not exist. Um, <laughs> specifically because uh, at the end of the day, we, we could have ended up making a campaign mechanic, but we wanted to focus our efforts in other areas. And so instead of just creating like, you know, I'm uh, pardon the expression, like a half-assed or something campaign mechanic, because those are something you have to devote a lot of time and effort and energy into. Like there, yeah. you have to build a game around being able to do campaign. Yeah. It's not something you can just throw on there. Yeah. Um, so that was something we didn't, we didn't have the, not necessarily the time, but we wanted to focus the efforts elsewhere. And so that's something that ended up getting cut. Yep. originally like we had like plans for like yeah we had like it got pretty far actually in like how we were going to handle it but it just became one of those things like okay is this really good enough to warrant all the effort and attention it's getting versus being able to take that same effort and really refining some other areas that we're super excited about versus making a campaign that works and is functional and you know yeah it would be nice to have yes but that was something that ended up getting cut and there were other aspects as well. There are the little micro like things that like, yeah, this would have been a cool mechanic. We incorporated it, but we ended up trimming it out just because, yeah, is it cool? Yeah, every idea is really cool, but is it useful? And if something's only useful like five or 10% of the game, you probably end up cutting it out. And that's just avoiding bloat and things like that. Yeah. So, you know, uh, the campaign was the big, the campaign like style thing was a big one that we ended up cutting out. Uh, there were some other minor ones that some of them I can I can and can't talk about, sure. but the other ones I can talk about are just so minor. It's like, oh yeah, right. We we thought about doing that and we didn't because we, you know, whatever. Yeah. So if you had to name one thing that you were the most proud of with this particular pro, uh, with this particular design, what would that be? I honestly do feel that we have captured the essence of all of the characters that we have done. I do feel that we have literally given them justice to like when you play this character, even if you don't know anything about them going in, you're going to get a feel for them and you're going to get their personality really quick. And I feel that if you are a big fan of the franchise and the IP, that you're going to be even more rewarded for like playing the character. Like every, I feel that every single character that we have made, even some of the obscure ones that may or may not show up during the campaign, you're going to go like, you know, this feels right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's really the main litmus test for this campaign is to make sure that the things that people care about, the characters in this case, uh, and the world and the setting, that those feel right. Because I think that would be the, the if we made a good game, or even a great game, mm -hmm. but it didn't feel like a Masters of the Universe game, it's a failure. Yeah. So, awesome. bottom line, that's that's how I feel about that topic. Fair. Now, moving into more of like the production side of things and that, and some of the more logistical parts of this, uh, I know that there's been some confusion about where you guys are going to be able to distribute this, sell this, crowdfund this game. So can you elaborate on where exactly you guys are able to due to licensing issues and whatnot with the Masters Universe? Oh, sure. That's a very easy answer there. Uh, we are launching on Kickstarter on September 14th. Uh, you will be able to, uh, we can ship the game to anywhere that is not Europe. 
Okay. So any of the Americas, um, Australia, you know, any, basically, like I said, anywhere that is not Europe. And that is specifically due to licensing agreements with Mattel. That is nothing that we have any control over or that can be changed in any way, shape or form. Um, but that is that is basically the technical answer there. Sure. That's fair. Yeah, I just I knew there was some confusion about that. So it'd be good to have everybody being able to on the same page with that one and yep. knowing where you can get this one at. We've seen I, some posts that, you know, people say like, oh, it's only available in America and Canada. And that is just again, not the case. It is literally available anywhere that is not Europe. And so, again, if you're if you're not sure if you're in Europe or not, then I guess check with your local magistrates and country and see if you're in Europe. But yeah. So with this one, with the campaign itself, it sounds like there's going to be a couple of different versions of this in a way. So I know that like you were you you guys just made that huge announcement that you're going to have Castle Grayskull as a 3D model. That looks fantastic. But can you elaborate a little bit on is there going to be multiple versions of this where it might be like two dimensional versus three dimensional, or how is that going to work within the campaign? Oh, Lance, now you're asking for campaign spoilers, and unfortunately, <laughs> that is an area that I will get in trouble if I divulge too much about. Fair. Um, but as you said, we did reveal our 3D Castle Grey Skull. And I can talk about that a little bit. But as far as like, you know, oh, what's the pledge levels going to sure. be like? What are what products are potentially going to show up or not? That's something I'm not at liberty to unfortunately go over at this time. But if you pay attention to social media, we'll be revealing more of that as time goes on. But I can talk about Grey Skull awesome. uh, in the fact that that is a full like it is a fully incorporated piece in the game. Okay. Uh, it is not just for display purposes or anything like that. It actually has full function uh, in the game. And I am still a little limited to how much I can and can't reveal about that specifically. Cause again, we have more information about that up and coming. Um, but I will say that like it dynamically does change things. Okay. It is really cool. And it, everything about it serves function in the game. It's not just something you're gonna be like, hey, I got this cool game. Oh, and I got that gray skull over there too. It's a, a giant nine inch tall castle that exists. No, you're actually going to have that on the game board. You're going to be doing stuff with it. Um, it, it, ah, see, I, I just, I can't say too much about it. So <laughs> I, I feel like I'm pulling like the George Martin approach. You're like, it's really cool. It's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to blow gonna your mind so when you see it. It's but I can't say great. it. <laughs> yeah. No so, offense to George R. R. Martin, by the way. Uh, he's a, a lovely guy. Oh, yeah. He's <laughs> amazing, amazing. Love the, uh, I mean, just being able to, to have more fantasy in our lives is, is, is a wonderful thing. So I'm always grateful to him for that. Um, so I would probably kick myself if the 10-year-old kid in me didn't ask, with the Castle Grayskull, is, it, is there going to be any type of interior design? Is it going to open up at all uh, for any type of interior kind of um, battles uh, or anything that's in there? Okay. So that is something I don't feel I'll probably get in trouble answering, but no, it does not open up, but the jaw bridge does actually I did work. See that. It that is, is a cool. fully functional jaw bridge, <laughs> jaw bridge, by the way, not a drawbridge. Um, but that part does open and actually does have game effects. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, but no, unfortunately, like it, yeah, it does. It, it, it's a, um, I don't want to exactly say what like the manufacturing part of this because I just I, I don't know specifically, but no, it doesn't open or anything like that. Okay. Um, it is is a a big terrain piece. Now you'll notice I will say some hints and everything uh, from the trailers. You might notice that there was areas on top. There were some slots on the side for that may or may not be used for various things. Like the, like I said, the thing is fully incorporated into gameplay. Like it, it it's, it's it's something you you play with. It's not something you just look at. That's awesome. I cannot wait to check that out. That looks so, so cool. Love that design. So obviously another question that, that you may or may not be able to answer. Um, is there any uh, anything else that might be showing up uh, in the campaign that might be like three-dimensional elements kind of like that? Now you're just like almost straight up asking for spoilers, but <laughs> I have I, I will say this. Uh, okay. This might even be verging too much on things I will get in trouble for, but you know what? Lance, for you, I will I will take the risk Thank you. <laughs> but one of the goals for this project when we were making it from just a not just gameplay but like a visual perspective mm. is like i get back to that whole thing i said before about you like playing with your action figures and like slamming them against each other and all that but something else to note about that is like yeah having the action figures and maybe having like you know your your water bottle set up like you know maybe you didn't get the gray skull play set when you were kids so you just had like you know a table and a chair over there <laughs> 
we want to be able to give you the full gambit and opportunity to recreate all those cool things that you played with or saw as a child on the game board and like not only just like mechanically but the visual in, the visual elements of this as a product are very my answering non-answer okay no that's that's fair and i appreciate that that for sure i mean I figure, you know, obviously looking at some of, of your past campaigns will also kind of tip the hat a little bit in seeing some of the things. Obviously, you're you're all about in, in version of, of the environment, all that kind of stuff. So looking at some of the other campaigns, there's always different terrain pieces and different things that uh, can incorporate things and, and just some of the over the top stuff, such as like Cthulhu for, from Death May Die is just massive in, in, in scale in that, that, that nobody would try except for you guys. And, you know, I mean, it was a huge success. So it'll be interesting to see what other kind of, of surprises we have um, as this campaign unfolds. That's a good way of putting it there, Lance, is the past is a very good indicator of the future. I can't get in trouble for saying that. There you go. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with this particular game, uh, is this going to be one that you guys are going to build on in the future? Is there going to be other things you guys are potentially looking at uh, for this, or is it just going to be the the game itself uh, once the campaign's done, and then that'll be it? Ah, that's actually a, a very interesting question here. Uh, which So one of the things that we are uh, trouting about this is that this is the Masters Universe game that is also based on the power system. Okay. And... So that's a very distinct thing that we've been saying. This is not necessarily the Masters of the Universe system. This is the power system that the Masters of the Universe uh, has been incorporated into. And granted, this is the only game technically of that system that we've released. But uh, as I just said, you know, the past being the greatest indicator of the future, if this is a success and people end up liking it, this is built with the idea of this is a system that could potentially be incorporated into other settings, games, and whatnot um, in the future. So, you know, again, if this is if this is a success, people end up liking it and they, they want more of it, then we'll give them more of it. Now, in what form that will take, whether it's more Masters of the Universe content or something completely entirely different, who knows? That's, that's you know, that's, ask me again in a year or two, Lance, and we'll see what the answer ends up being. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is pretty much all I have. So thank you so much for sharing all the, these little tidbits with us and the information. And so the campaign's coming up close here. We've only got a couple weeks left uh, before the campaign starts, so we'll get to, to really see all the, the cool stuff that is planned for that very shortly. So again, thank you so much, Michael, for, for taking us through this, and I do really appreciate it. And uh, Looking forward to seeing all the cool new stuff that comes out with this one. Yeah, I'd like uh, we have so much content planned for this campaign. I... I think it'd be very hard pressed if you're a fan of Masters of the Universe to walk away from this uh, disappointed, unless you know there's like certain like niche character out there that you're like, oh man, you know they didn't they didn't touch this one specific character, and you know I think in a lot of those cases you're probably gonna not be disappointed here either. As I said, the last like final little minor like spoiler I guess we'll give is more of a, a phrase. Like, again, I can't get in trouble for just saying statements, right? Um, as I said previously, this is based on the original toy line, first and foremost. Um, of the original toy line, there just happens to be roughly around 73 miniatures, uh, sorry, action figures um, <laughs> that exist in that line mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm not saying like, oh, you granted, like, okay, like 10 of those are Skeletor and He-Man. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, just again, a statement, like I, a lot of what we're doing is based on the original toy line, not entirely but majority of it based on yeah. the original toy line. So, you know, awesome. maybe, Lots of cool maybe stuff. somebody to look into there. <laughs> Lots of cool <laughs> stuff in that their toy line. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing all this stuff. And uh, thank all of you for joining us. I hope you found this interview interesting. And if you have any questions or comments, post those down in the comment section below. I'll do my best to answer them. Or if all else fails, I can swing them over to... Uh, Michael, and see if we can get some answers on some of this stuff as well. And then if not, definitely drop any comments or questions you have in the Kickstarter campaign questions as well. Uh, they'll be monitoring those and checking all that stuff out and uh, giving all kinds of information in there as well. So thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time. Bye.